that I am. <coughs> Amen. Amen. While you're making your way back to your chair, make sure you got a Bible and make sure you've got an outline that says the vocabulary of salvation. The vocabulary of salvation. Romans chapter 3 tonight. Romans chapter 3 this evening. Get back over there as we pick back up our verse by verse study of the book of Romans. Look at Romans chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 21. You see Romans 3, verse 21? You see it, say, I see it. I want you to, oh, y'all, there ain't many of y'all there yet, just the ones on the front. Get your Bible open. If you own a Bible, you need to be bringing it to church. Don't depend on the screens. What if the computers go out? Right? Romans chapter 3, verse 21. If you got it, I want you to hold up your Bible and say, I got it. All right, now we need to see more Bibles in here on Wednesday night. Amen? Look at somebody and say, bring your Bible next week, baby. There you go. Brother Todd, leave you alone. All right, if you got it open, if you don't have a Bible with you, I want you to look over at somebody's Bible that's open, and if you got a Bible, I want you to be Christian-like and share it. Everybody looking at it. Romans 3, verse 21 through about verse 31. If you see it, say, I see it. I want you to look at it and say, hello, chapter 3. Look, keep looking at it. Don't look at me. And say, Brother Todd says, we're going we're gonna to be friends for a little while. I don't know no other way to introduce you. No, you don't have to say that. I don't know no other way to tell you that we're going to be in these 11 verses for a while other than just to get you to be acquainted with it. Originally, I was going to preach through these verses all in one night. But... The more I studied it and the more I prayed on it, and I don't want to get, ever get bogged down, but the reality is so much of what Paul is stating in the book of Romans is here. There on your outline tonight, you'll see underneath the first uh, verses 21 to verse 26, you see a, you see a quote there uh, by, I just, I just noted the man's last name, Leon Lamb Morris was an Australian uh, New Testament scholar and theologian. And he said in his book on, on the, the, Paul's epistle to the Romans, it, uh, I, just a part of a little quote there right underneath the scriptures, it says, he said, this passage is possibly the most important single paragraph that's ever been written. And, and really, in truth, it is. It's two sentences long. Paul was notorious for writing run-on sentences. And uh, for a person that, you know, made a 72 over a lifetime in English, uh, that was one of the complaints that they always told me. My English teacher in high school says, Todd Peavy, I wish somebody, I wish there had somebody never taught you about a comma. Because I throw a comma in and just keep going. And I even use a semicolon. I just, I hate to end one, you know, I just ramble on. I ramble on in my speech. I ramble on in my writing. But he, uh, but two sentences long, little paragraph that may be the most important paragraph ever written as it concerns me and you and being before God now if you've been with us as we've been studying the book of Romans you know that really what we've been covering the last few weeks even as we began the chapter was uh, as we began the book in chapter 1 when we got to verse 18 and Paul started talking about how in verse 16 he wasn't ashamed of the gospel because the gospel revealed God's righteousness to man because the wrath of God had already been revealed to man. And if you remember that, from that point till we got to, to chapter verse 20 last week, frankly, it's just been getting darker and darker and darker. It is, it is, it is God laying out a case against mankind. Like a prosecuting attorney. He's convinced every juror that mankind is guilty. Right? Remember, the pagan, the moralist, the person who knows the word, indeed all of humanity. 
Remember old brother Phillips, we, we hit those words with the H's, right? The heathen is guilty, the hypocrite is guilty, the Hebrew is guilty, and all of humanity is guilty. Really, that's, that's, what we, that's the conclusion we've come to, right? Amen? And you know, so much of the time, that's all uh, one of the things the world doesn't like about the churches, that's all we go around talking about. Now, Paul has not been doing it just to make us all feel doom and gloom, but for us to realize what God really wants to do with mankind. If you will look at verse 21, you see two little words, six letters, that make all the difference. But now. Everybody's guilty. But now. Hitler, guilty. Your sweet little grandmama, guilty. You're guilty. I'm guilty. You look around the room, you're a sinner. Look in the mirror, you're a sinner. But now, everything is about to change. He's about to show why he has been establishing the fact that mankind is guilty, that everyone is sinful. He's been doing it so that we can see that everyone can have salvation. Okay? As he begins to work into these two sentences, you are going to see one powerful phrase after another. And there is no way, no way, even if I wasn't a long-winded preacher, that I could get through verses 21 through 26 in anything less than a couple of hours and, and, and give it any kind of consideration at all. So what I want to do, and to help us, really this is, this is going to help give you a shorter sermon next week. I don't know how else to put it. But next week, because you were here this week, it's going to be short. And you're just going to be sitting there going, that's right, that's right. Because you're going to already know the vocabulary of salvation. 1982, I've been thinking about it all day long, was probably the last vocabulary list that I got. Oh, yeah. The devil and his kindred spirits that I called my school teacher were always giving me lists. Every Monday, I got two lists that gave me trouble all week. That was my spelling list. Can I get a boo for spelling list? Is somebody? Boo. Boo. When you go home tonight and you tell your kids, you got you to do your spelling work, I'm going to tell you behind that child is a pastor that is saying, give that child mercy, give that child grace, let them have some ice cream and put them to bed. Oh, I hated my spelling list because I was a terrible speller from the get-go and I got worse as time went on. I was so happy when I got to high school, they told me no more spelling tests until my junior year. My last year of English, we had one six weeks, and it was spelling. My first test was 35. My second one was a 25. My English teacher pulled me to the side and said, Todd, are you trying? I said, Miss Wig, I'm trying with everything in me. You told me I only have six. We have six grades that week. It was a spelling test at the end of every week. And I, you know I'm a terrible speller, and so I just decided I just ain't even going to worry about it. My beating is coming. I'm go, because back then it wasn't no pass, no play. It was don't flunk more than three a week. And uh, so, you know, I could usually stay above my head above just two classes at a time. And so uh, I said, look, I just got a beating coming at the end of this six weeks. And uh, because my old man was a 70, was as good as 169, was as good as a zero. So why not get the zero? Because the whooping's coming anyway. And she said, I just want you to study. And I studied and I worked. And the highest grade I made was a 50. And, and uh, Miss Wig gave me a 72. I said, Miss Wig, why a 72? She said, I didn't want your daddy to think I'd been fiddling with your grade. <laughs> Not just a 70, a 72. But anyway, back to, back to the list. They'd also give you a vocabulary list. You'd have to write down the definitions of it. And I hated those lists. And even though I hated those lists, as sorry as it sounds, I'm going to give you a vocabulary list. And next week, I want you to bring that outline with you. I want you to keep it in your Bible. 
And next week, I'll have you another outline. And when we're talking about things next week, you're going to have your cheat sheet. Now, everybody that missed that just was sinful and skipped out, we're not going to help them next week. We're not going to give them a list. I'm not even going to let you look on. In fact, you do that, it'll be like at school. You're not going to be able to look. They're not going to be able to look. You're not going to be able to help them. (laughs) Next week, I'll probably have a copy of that list. But you want to have your original. Because if you do that, then I'm going to give you extra credit, and you'll get another 15 minutes at recess. (laughs) Everybody good? Okay. So I, I know I've been wasting a lot of your time to get that across, but what I want you to do tonight is let's look at what's here. And we're going to kind of work it, we're going to talk about it in the context of the verses, but what we're going to do, Lord willing, is next week you'll take your list and we'll take the word here and we'll see how he's putting these things together. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Eleven words in your vocabulary list this week let's begin to read verse 21 but now the righteousness of god apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ to all and on all who believe for there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Probably the most famous verse out of the... Notice that that whole verse is really just a statement in between two commas. See it? Verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Brother David, do you have the rest of those verses from verse uh, chapter 3? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. In other words, we fulfill everything the Word of God had said about saving a soul that is in desperate need of being saved. On your vocabulary list, I want you to write down the first word, and that word is change. Change. Something has changed, but now, in verse 21. Before, we've seen that mankind is in sin. Now, we're going to see how God is going to remedy that problem. Mankind is cursed and apart from God, but mankind is going to be brought before the Lord. All who will come in faith, there is going to be a situation that is different. You follow me? The heathen guilty the hypocrite guilty hebrew those who know the word of god guilty indeed all of humanity verse 19 and verse 20 they are what they are convicted by the law and what's verse 20 say remember from last week they are condemned by the law they have been convicted in the court of 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 god and they have been sentenced in the court of god verse 21 but now There is a change in the situation. Number two, your your vocabulary word is the word canon. Canon. C-A-N-O-N. Not a cannon that shoots, uh, you know, on a ship or on some fort somewhere, but a canon, a standard. If I told to you tonight, you hold in your hands, if you have your Bible, what you hold is the canon of Scripture. 
Would you, do you know, have you ever heard that term? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that term. Well, you've heard it now. We have the canon of scriptures, the 66 books of the Bible, the assembled standard, the assembled rule, okay? Out to the side of it, because I know that's a word that maybe you're not, you're not, maybe you're not too familiar with, I just want you to write down the word scriptural. Scriptural. Salvation is scriptural. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. In other words, not by the keeping of the law. Why? Because all of mankind is guilty, and mankind has not kept the law, right? Sermon on the Mount proves it, if anything else proves it. It's being revealed, but look, this righteousness of God, apart from the law, has been witnessed by the law and the prophets. When Jesus talked about Moses and the prophets, or the law and the prophets, what he was talking about was, was the majority of the Old Testament text. People back in that day, that's what they would call what we would call our Bible. We called the Old Testament. They would call it the law and the prophets. Sometimes you'll hear it called the law, the wisdom, the wisdom books, and, and, the, and the prophets, or, or, or the, uh, that, that kind of thing, where you would talk about Psalms and Job and, and places like that. But what it's talking about is the Old Testament. And what he's saying here is that the salvation that God has promised to mankind is the salvation that God was going to bring to mankind. That everything in the law is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. If you would, just somewhere, write down these two words, just out beside the word canon. Write down the word moral, and write down the word ceremonial. And don't, don't look at me like I know how to spell ceremonial ceremonial can't even say it right ceremonial i can spell moral m ends with l ceremony starts with a s sounds like but i'm sure it's a c yeah all them c and mess me up anyhow ceremonial moral and ceremony you say brother todd why am i writing down them words well out beside moral and ceremonial i want you to write down the word law the moral law and the ceremonial law Moral, the moral law, the ceremonial law, okay? Everything in the law, everything was given by God. Here is the conduct. Here is the standard. Here are the things you do to please me are, are based on, on, on one of those two sides. There's the moral law. There was the ceremonial law. The moral law convicts us of sin. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lust. You shall not have a, a, commit adultery. You shall not covet, right? Your father. You shall have no other gods before me. And by that law, we all find ourselves guilty. Jesus said, you've heard that you shouldn't be angry with your brother. But I tell you, if you've been angry with your brother without a cause, you've committed murder. I say, you've heard, you shall not commit adultery, but if you've looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already. Morally, we're guilty. The moral law establishes the righteousness of God, and it comes to one big conclusion, we don't measure up. That's what chapters 1, 2, and 3 have been talking about. If that makes sense, say, I got it. What did the ceremonial law do? Keep this feast. Bring this sacrifice. Have the sin offering. Have the burn offering. You tried to read the book of Leviticus. You quit reading your Bible. Yeah, I'm going to read my Bible through. I got through Genesis. I made it through most of Exodus. I got to Leviticus. Brother Todd, I just got lost. Don't do this, do this. Blue thread and gold emblems and all that. What in the world's going on? Ceremonial. It's the part of the law we don't keep anymore. The moral law of God is as is as much in force today as it's ever been. It's, it still is God's standard, and it still convicts us of sin. Does that make sense? Why do we not keep the ceremonial law anymore? Because the ceremonial law was a temporary covering for sin. But Christ is the complete covering for sin. That's why the writer of Hebrews said is if, if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, if those of you that are familiar with the law, 
could have carried away sin, they would be offered unto this day. So there's the moral law and the ceremonial law, and Jesus bringing us salvation is the fulfillment of both of those aspects. Our, our, our sin has found us out, but we have a covering for sin. And, the, and Jesus Christ, is, he's not something new. He's the fulfillment. Calvary's cross is not a new idea that God hatched out because the sacrificial system wasn't working. But the sacrificial system was a picture of what Jesus was going to do. Does that make sense? In the Old Testament, in the ceremonial law, I'll give you a for instance. There was a sin offering and there was a burnt offering right and in both cases mark man we would put our hands on on the lamb on the sacrifice before our 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 sacrifice was offered but they were different now they looked very much the same but god went through all this detail of making them different why well in the sin offering we identified the, the, the lamb as being the payment for our sin. Does that make sense? But in the burnt offering, it was flipped. We put our hands on the lamb to assume the purity and righteousness of the lamb. Have you ever read in Corinthians where it says, he, who knew, he made him who knew no sin to become sin? that we might become the righteousness of God in Him? That is, that is not something, that's not something God came up with later. He had a whole ceremonial system of He becomes, Jesus became sin, that we might become the righteousness of the sacrifice. Does that make sense? That's why we don't keep it anymore. But Christ in and us accepting Christ in the gospel is not unscriptural. It fits in with the canon of Scripture. And the word canon is not just the term. It means the standard. It means the rule. Does that make sense? Well, you, it's the measurement. Okay? If you got that, say, I got it. Number three, we have another vocabulary word for next week, and that's the word crowd. The crowd. Notice that this salvation, where this salvation is applied, gets talked about quite a bit in these verses. Verse 22, it says, It is to all and on all. Verse 23 says, All have sinned. If you get down to verse 26, it talks about the one who has faith in Jesus. It's personal. It, it applies to everyone. Not every, we, walk, we come into it one by one. But the, but the reality of salvation is that it reaches out to a whole crowd. So look at, that, look at that idea as we read here. Verse 21, Now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Because what, why? Going back. They're going to say, well, hold on a minute. You can't do anything that's not lawful. He said, Jesus ain't done anything that's unlawful. He's the fulfillment of it. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ, Jesus Christ, to all and on all who will believe. Why? Because there's no difference. What, what does he mean by no difference? It's verse 23 that we know so well. For all have sinned and come short and fall short of the glory of God. Okay? It, it applies, it, it reaches out to everyone. The whole crowd needs to be saved. The whole crowd can be saved. Now, running around in the church today are a bunch of brethren that are just absolutely convinced that Jesus died for just a few. We call them hyper-Calvinists. All of us as, as, as Baptists and as, and as evangelicals, we hold Calvinistic views. Okay, A lot of people hear the term, they don't know what it means. But you can take things to an extreme. John Calvin wasn't as extreme as the people that's come along behind him that claim to follow along kind of with his ways of teaching. Okay? You say, Brother Todd, I don't know about all this. Here's what you really need to know in life. Jesus loves everybody. The only people that are going to come are the people that God calls, and the only people that are going to come are people that call on God. 
And it'll be both. It'll be both. Now there's a big, they have a big, uh, they big, have big hug a blue all the time, and preachers like to go to conferences and write papers about it. But it's basically a something right now that I think just keeps preachers that are too lazy to do anything else just gives them something to sit around and talk about. I don't, I don't know. But anyhow, I think, I think most churches that have lost a desire for souls say that, well, if there's not anything wrong, it's just God's not saving the elect right now. And so we're okay, and we really don't need invitations because they take too much time anyway because Brother Todd preaches forever as it is, and Art sings too long. And why do an invitation? Because if they're going to come, they're going to come anyway. Guys, that, that, that is just looking at it from the whole wrong side. Jesus died for the elect, the Bible says. The Bible says he also died for the sins of the whole world. Now, people look at it and say, one of those has got to be right and one of those is wrong, but God said them both. I guarantee you, when God gets done at the end of the day, it'll all make sense. Just because it's bigger than your understanding doesn't mean it's bigger than God's. Everybody can be saved. The Spirit of God that brings salvation appeared to all men. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says he died for the sins of every man. If Jesus died for the sins of mankind, then mankind can be saved. Anybody ever says limited atonement, they say, you need to believe in limited atonement. You say, I, my pastor told me I need to put on my shoes and get away from you. We're not Calvinistic in that sense. In any way, stretch of the imagination. We believe once we're saved that God doesn't cast us off. Okay? We call it once saved, always saved, the security of the believer. All believers are perpetual. You know your little tulips and whatnot. If you don't know what I'm talking about, again, don't worry about it. But if you've been reading, think you know something now. If you, the more you learn about Jesus, the less conscious you become of lost souls the less you know about Jesus. If the more you study, the less you care about lost people dying and going to hell, friend, you have studied yourself into being a fool. Say, some of y'all are brutal. I don't even know what I made many. Could I just get an amen anyway? There you go. Just stick, just, we'll just give it to them over there. It's nonsense. Wait for churches to sit around being lazy. Not, not caring about lost people. Jesus loved lost people. Jesus died for lost people. If lost people can't come to Jesus, why did Jesus go to so many of them? Why did he weep over Jerusalem? Was he just weeping over the elect there? Did he tell Jonah, why are you upset? There's very few elect people here. No. There's 120,000 people here who don't know their right hand from their left. Why shouldn't I be merciful? I'm a, he's a good God. God wants all mankind to be saved. You say, well, Brother Todd, I know I've read about the... Hey, man, I know, I know all about the elect. I quote you more scriptures about it. You can't without trying to sound pious or, or prideful. But never get yourself in a place where you have got God painted into a box, making him think he can't put one more angel on the head of a pen and all that kind of nonsense. Just believe that God loves people. God wants people saved. At the end of the day, everybody that's in heaven will be chosen, and everybody that's in heaven will have chosen. Period. You can write me a letter off the email or e internet or whatever, but you'll just be wrong at the end of the day if you don't think God chooses and if you don't think that mankind must choose. Now again, don't eliminate the choosing of God. Okay? It ain't man first, it's God first. But God wants people saved. And God's offer to save people is valid. Okay? Again, I know y'all all agree with me, but who knows who might listen to this. Or I hope you do. Again, if you study yourself to a point that you have lost a desire for lost people to be saved, you have studied yourself the wrong direction. All the apostles, we're soul hungry. The early church was soul hungry. And Jesus was surely hungry for lost souls. Will a man not leave the 99 and reach out to that one that is lost? Is, amen? And we want to be a soul hungry church. 
And it's the whole crowd. And it's the one that's hard to deal with. It's not just the pretty. It's not just the benevolent. It's everybody. And some people, to, to help them, it, it, it takes a lot out of it. Amen? I got news for you. When you was lost, you took a lot out of other people too. And it's going to take a church that doesn't mind the cost because we recognize Jesus was willing to go to the cross for this soul. Amen? We don't ever want to be where picker and choosers. We don't ever want to be where we're bringing people to Jesus just because they're like us or they, or they like us. But, that, but we, are, we are hungry for, look at it, what it says, to all and on all. Why? Because all have sinned. Okay, I'm through whooping on that. Number four, your vocabulary word is the word character. Character. In salvation, we see the character of God sinned against, and we see the character of God revealed. Look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God. Verse 23, we have sinned, we've fallen short of what? The glory of God. What is God's glory? We say, well, Brother Todd, it's, it's smoky and it's, it's lightning. And, well, yeah, those are all aspects of being around in the presence of God. And those may be glorious things. But what makes God glorious is who he is. It's who he is that is so glorious. And who he is is what we've fallen short of. The glory of God is the reality of his goodness, his power, his mercy, his ability, his intellect, his eternalness, his omniscience. I mean, you just you go through the list. You just name the attributes of God. Those are all the things that make him glorious. His holiness makes him glorious. And we've all fallen short of that in this though we see here his character if you got your bible open go back to to chapter one and remember how all this began paul says as much as he gave his introduction to the romans he told him in verse 15 he was so ready to preach the gospel to him why was he ready paul why are you ready well because he's not ashamed of the gospel well paul why are you not ashamed of the gospel why are you so ready with it well because it's the power of god to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, how does that work, Paul? Well, because in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, beginning in faith and growing in faith, and ultimately in heaven, concluding faith. As it's written, the just shall live by faith. Why is this important, Paul? Because verse 18, because the wrath of God is revealed. It's already known in the world. God's already made his case against sin. And if God is going to save mankind that is guilty, he is going to have to demonstrate his righteousness. Well, in verse 18, he talks, we say, well, Paul, why is God wrathful against mankind? And Paul would say, well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you about guilt. And let me tell you who's guilty. The heathen is guilty. In chapter 2, and the hypocrite is guilty, right? And chapter 3, the, more, the, the Hebrew is guilty. And guess what? All of humanity is guilty. But now, he reminds us of verse 17 of chapter 1. The righteousness of God is revealed. Man is a sinner, and he's been demonstrating man's character, but bless God, now he starts talking about God's character. And there's hope. See how he's putting it together? See how he just lays it out for him? Did you ever think there was such a connection between a chapter 3 and a chapter 1 in all your Bible? God is showing himself and his goodness in the reality that he wants to save mankind. And he saves us to such a point that he reaches a conclusion, and that's number 5, that's your next word. A conclusion that is absolutely amazing. And the conclusion God brings the saved to 
And what he gives when he saves is something called justification. Verse 24. We've fallen short of the glory of God. Why? Well, I'm not going to run back through that because, again, I'm going to preach all this again next week. And that'll be the short version. So come back. And if you don't believe that, come back anyway. But anyway, we sin, we've fallen short of the glory of God, we've, but we've been freely justified. We've been justified freely by His grace. He does this why? Back to verse, look at verse 26. In part, to demonstrate at this present time his righteousness, his character, right? That he might be just and the justifier. If the judge is an honest judge, he must render judgment based on reality. If you'll read your Bible... You will see in the Old Testament where many times God said he despised a judge that would set loose the guilty and harm the innocent. Does it appear as though he is doing it? If we are indeed so sinful, how can we be saved? Without holiness, no man will see God. How does God declare us innocent when we have been proven guilty? How are we justified? Now what that means to be justified, if I'm sitting before a judge and, and I'm guilty, I can, I can plead guilty and ask for mercy, right? But if I'm guilty and I walk up to the judge and I honestly say, not guilty, what's your plea? I plead not guilty. You say, Brother Todd, how could that be? If the condition of my innocence and my holiness are accomplished and given, so that I'm in a position of absolute cleanliness and holiness, though I've had sin in my life and have sin in my life, I can stand before God and say not guilty. If I'm what? Not looking for mercy, but I've been justified. That's the sense here. The conclusion that God has reached with his children is he declares us not guilty. How in the world do we go from guilty to not guilty? Well, without getting into next week's sermon too much, look, we are justified. What did it cost? It was free. How was it accomplished? By His grace. Through what? Through this thing called redemption. How does that work? Well, God sets forth His, his Son as a propitiation, a covering. How did, what paid for it? His blood. How's it applied? Through faith. But the reality is this. When we have come to Christ through faith, through the power of His shed blood, when He forgives us, He also, on top of that, justifies us. He not only forgives us of what we are, not only is our sin paid for in Christ, but His nature is given to us. And when you got saved, the nature of Christ himself came alive in your spirit. And that's why it doesn't say you can't, you're in a justifiable position. He says you've been justified. It's past tense. It is a work that is accomplished. Positionally, we are in Christ. In our spirit, we are as sinless as Christ. How can we stand before God? His nature's been given to us. What does the Scripture say? When the Father see, when you make His soul an offering for sin, He will see Him. Oh, we say it like this. Oh, the Father looks at us through Jesus. That's not really true. 
He looks at us in Jesus. Woo! My God! Do you recognize what Christ did for you when he saved you? A lowly sinner we come and we, and we rise up from prayer with the nature of Christ burning within us? That's why if you're saved, you can't sin and love it. The nature of Christ compels you, stirs you. And this is where our good work comes from. Because it is the work of Christ in our spirit working out through our mind and our body. The works don't save us. By the works of the law, all men are guilty. But those works come forth because of the justification Christ has given us so that when he sees us, he says justified, clean, holy. That's what ought to compel us to live sinless lives. Not so God will love us, but because God has loved us. Not so God will accept us, but because he has accepted us. Don't that give you freedom? I'm not trying to live to please God. I'm living because Christ has already pleased the Father. And he's alive in me. The only way you're going to get into heaven is to pr be pronounced acceptable. To stand up in front of the bar of God and say, not guilty. A sinner like me with his hand in the air saying, not guilty? What? Something better have happened. And what's happened is, is not only did Christ pay for my sin, but the nature of Christ has been given to us. You say, my grandpa's in heaven. He ain't there because he was a good old Joe, baby. He's there because the nature of Christ came alive in him. God chose him and he chose Christ. Don't, it, don't you see now, if you think about it, how foolish it is for mankind and his idea of religion to come to God and say, I can earn your acceptance? Do you see the fallacy in that now? Do you see the foolishness in that? When it takes the very nature of Christ to, to be pleasing to the Father, to be able to stand at, in heaven and, and, and plead not guilty based on who you are in Christ, that's amazing. It's, it's mind-blowing. It might be as mind-blowing a thing as God does with any of us when he saves us. Of the 16 things that God does, one he takes away, 15 things he adds, what the Word of God teaches us, that when he saves us, this crowning jewel of the whole thing might be he justifies us. Because justification sits on top of mercy. Like a, crown, uh, like a jewel sits on top of a crown. Somebody write that down. I like, I like how that sounds. Now write me a book. I'll throw it in there. I forgot it. I hope you remembered it. <laughs> Justification sets on salvation like a jewel on top of a crown. Woo, David Johnstone. That sounds fancy, man. You tell somebody at my funeral I said that. But Brother Todd asked me to stand up and say this was the most profound thing he ever said about salvation. His character, verse number four. Number five, a conclusion. Number six, we have the word channel. The channels. In fact, I couldn't remember if I'd made it plural or not. The channels of salvation. How does salvation get to us? Verse 22, through faith. Verse 24, it's given freely by his grace. Verse 26. He may be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What do I mean by channel? I mean how does salvation get to us? How does this justification come to us? Well, God runs it down channels of blessing. And one of those channels, if you'll notice there, is this thing called faith. The capacity to believe God enough to act. Hebrews 11.1 1. Now faith is the evidence of things hoped for. It is the substance of something not seen. 
Brother, can you bring up that verb? Oh, David Patrick is on top of his game. Best guy, best guy from Sigaville ever was. Now, faith is, don't that almost look like a puzzle? I've looked at that verse like a, like a man looking for at a jigsaw puzzle most of my Christian life. Having a grasp of what it looks like, but, you know, like, man, what? Still come back to it every time I read through it. Lord, I hope one day I actually get more understanding of that verse. About three weeks ago, God ripped part of the covering off of it for me. Got to focusing on the word hope. Faith is substance of things that are hoped for. Hope is a desire. Faith is what allows me to operate towards that desire. It is what is there if there's a desire. It is evidence of something that is not yet seen. It's not yet done. But it's the recognition that it's God's will. And it's the recognition that I need to be acting in God's will. So how do I do that? I do that in faith. Faith has substance to it. It is the expression of what is hoped for. If there is no expression of what's hoped for, the hope will never become a reality. Now, by faith, hope, and love, these three, the greatest of these is love. But the first of them is hope. And my faith is the expression of the desire. You hope that God would save you while he called you, and you, and you prayed, and you acted towards God in faith, and you spoke a word of faith in accordance with Scripture. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You believe that enough to act. It became the evidence of what your desire was. It's the confession when something is not done yet, the evidence of what is not seen yet. It's the confession that the husband is going to be saved because God has revealed it. It's, a, it's the child that's going to be saved because God has revealed it. It's even the physical healing that is, that is spoken of in the past tense if God's given you a word on it. Again, now that's key. It's not God's will to heal every sickness. But when it is his will and he's revealed it to you, you've got somewhere you can claim and faith stands there and expresses the hope even when everybody else in the room goes, well, yeah, that might be all right, but. It's the things are tight, but you still believe God enough to tithe. You never know anything about faith till it touches your money. And you'll never learn more about faith till you surrender some of your money. Amen? It's easy to sit here and agree with the preacher. Oh, that's right. People need to feel better. Oh, that's right. People need to live full lives. Oh, that's right. You, oh, I need to. Well, God wants how much of my money? The only thing God ever said, test me on, right, was money. See if I, won't, see if I don't rain down blessings upon you. But uh, there comes an act of faith. It ain't seen yet. The promise isn't given yet, but you know it's on its way. Faith is the expression of the desire. It's the trust. It's the belief. It's the act of the will. You've heard me say it a hundred times. I don't know what old preacher said it first. You've heard me do this a bunch, but I'll do it one more time. I can look at this chair, and I can say it looks pretty structurally stable. It's got a bunch of cards in the back that I don't need right now for my illustration. And it's made out of metal, and it's got wood, and I can feel it, and it looks pretty solid, and I can kick on it. And I come to the intellectual conclusion that that chair can hold up my 275 pounds. Is it holding me up? Nope. I intellectually ascend to the fact that that thing, with its nuts and bolts and whatnot, can hold me up. I stand here talking about it and walking around it for five or six hours, and I'll be hoping it holds me up. David, I'll be tired. 
emotionally, I'll be connected to it. I want it to hold me up. I believe it can, and I want it to. Y'all look at me. And the reason I'm going through this one more time, and I think it's the best illustration I can give you on it, is you might be sitting out there with this same thing happening in your salvation. You believe Jesus can save you, and you hope that Jesus will save you. But is he holding you up? He can. We hope that he will. Scriptures say he will. Scriptures say he wants to. But I am not sitting in this chair, trusting in this chair, till I put my weight on it. And it took an act of my will to agree with myself intellectually and agree with myself emotionally till it comes to a point of what we call the, the volition. An act of my will. Faith. The expression of what I hoped for. I hoped I would sit down and not fall on the ground. Looks like my faith in this chair was justified. Now faith is a reality of life that you and me live in every day. The whole world uses faith. God set it up that way so that, so that we could grasp this. You know, Brother Todd, I know people don't use no faith. Oh, yeah, you do. They took their medicine this morning, didn't they? Believing that it was what somebody wrote on a label that it was. You believe that the cook at the restaurant was not back there mixing up strychnine in your pancake because you ate them. Right? You trusted the bank. You put your check in that bank. You trust the other driver on the road? Do y'all realize how close we drive vehicles next to each other at 70, 80? Some of y'all sinners, David Patrick, 90 miles an hour? That's just from Sandy to you. We drive by each other on things separating us a little yellow line. Think about it. You out driving on the road with somebody, picking at their teeth, checking their Facebook. You got faith in humanity. Don't tell me you don't. See, God set it up this way so that this is something we grasp. So what does he say? He says, trust me. He said, believe my son. We say, oh, oh, only an idiot would use faith. Only an idiot. That's a leap into the dark. No, it ain't. You've been doing it all day long. It's just you don't like Jesus. You just don't want to surrender to the claim. You don't want to admit you need to be held up. Right now, you might not think you need holding up. Whether you're in here or out in internet land, but I got news for you, baby. There's coming a day you're going to need something to hold you up. When death comes, you ain't stopping it. The relationship craters today, you're going to be touched by it. Health goes, you're going to need something to hold you up. What if you start losing your mind? You need something to hold you up. What about when death hits close to you? What about when it's you that gets the call? What's going to have holding you up? Tell me we don't need something to hold us up. I was an 11-year-old boy when I sat down, as it were, on Jesus. I'll say this, he ain't failed me yet. Solid as a rock. He ain't left me. Hadn't wavered on me. I've wavered on him. He never wavered on me. I say my faith is justified. Brother Charles Mass, I'm not Charles Mass, Latham Mass. Ruby's, uh, Barbara, are you here tonight? She had to go to the hospital. Her Latham, let me get you to tell you the story. Two Sundays ago, Latham Mass came and sat right there behind Mike Grahowski. Walked in here, lung cancer in his bone. Ruby's nephew. 
after church, visiting with folks. I went back there to talk to him. He wanted to talk to me a second. I could see he was sick. We talked. He's lost. He's lost. He, he called out to Christ, and he asked him to save him, sitting right back there. I baptized him at his house last Thursday because he had went down so bad that he couldn't get back to church. But he wanted to be baptized. You know what was going to happen. He died Monday. I'm doing his funeral Friday. I went over there and was baptizing him and uh, had his family there, his grandson sitting there. And I was talking to him. And I said, right here, your granddaddy, your daddy, your friend is making as great a testimony for Jesus as you can make. Because he's been saved now for four days and he's living in a reality of peace and power that God's given him. And if he wasn't, he'd tell you. He's lived his whole life without Jesus. He'd tell you he didn't need him now if he didn't need him now. He wouldn't be worried about making this baptism, making this statement to you that he has died in Christ, been buried in him, and has risen in him, and Christ has done something real in him. The greatest testimony he can give you he is dying, and he's telling you Jesus is enough. You say, Brother Todd, faith is a leap into the dark. No, it ain't. Look around you. Why is that brother walking in that? Why are these old people in here? Mamaw's 90 years old. Mamaw's been in more church services than all of us put together. Mamaw go to church, just sit in a church when nobody else is there just to be at church. All I had to tell her right now, Mama, we're going to open the doors on Thursday between 10 and 11 if you want to come just sit in the church. And she'd be here. And Mama or Aunt Vina would be bringing it. And you'd be handling it too. Why? 90 years, and there's nothing that nobody she loves more than us, her family, and her church. And Mama's relatively straight. You get to know Mama. Mama will tell you some things you don't even want to hear. If it was a lie, if it was empty, if from the time she was young when she was saved as a young teenager, through all the years in her widowhood and raising family and the heartbreaks and the funerals that she's been to, if there was nothing in it, why would she be here? Would, doesn't she love me enough to say, Todd, you know what, it's all a lie. Don't waste your time. something there there's something there my other grandma grandma Pete was a widow 44 years before she died she'd lay on her bed as long as she was conscious tell you I'm with Jesus I'm with Jesus why grandma there's something there Baby, you ain't a fool to put your trust in Jesus. Jesus is the most real thing this world's ever seen. You say, well, Brother Todd, if I could just see him. When he talks to you, it ain't real. When all of a sudden a voice comes that you never hear, but you understand it, that ain't big. It's one thing if you hear Todd Peavy, I'm in here rattling on in front of you. But when God speaks, and says your name, and you know it's him, and you know what he wants. Have you ever noticed God doesn't use sentences? Have you ever noticed that he has no problem expressing his desire? And you know it now. That ain't big. That ain't supernatural. That ain't big enough for you. All of his statements have come to pass. The church he said would exist is existing. The things that he does are happening. The world is moving according, right according to Scripture. You can put your trust in the Lord. And Christian, I'd remind you, the same God saved you big enough for the situation you're in now. He's big enough to take you to heaven. He's big enough to balance the checkbook. Just listen to him. See if he don't lead you along. Where are we at? Number two, three, seven. Y'all, such a hurry. Number seven. 
Let's pick up the word covering. And I, I'm, I want y'all to know now, I just cut that short because I only talked about one of the channels, and that's faith. We could have talked about free and grace, but we'll, we'll add that on to next week's sermon, make it a little longer. Number seven. Swan says, I'm being cheated. Number seven, a covering. See that word propitiation, verse 25? That's a big word. In the simplest terms, it means appeasement. It means that Jesus appeases the righteousness, the judgment of the Father. It means he appeases his justice, but it's more than that. It's a complete covering for it. It's an absolute meeting place between God and man. The best example of it I can give you is, is always you go back to what it is. It's, it's a meeting place. It's a covering. It's the, it's, the, uh, it's the place where the blood was applied on the Ark of the, of the, of the Covenant. God above, the law here, mankind guilty. Mankind's not stood up to the law. On top of that ark, there is the lid. That lid was covered with blood. That was the propitiation place. That was the meeting place. And Christ is that meeting place. Your own work is going to leave you short. Your church membership can't cover it. We have to meet in Christ. Buddha can't do it. Muhammad can't do it. It's got to be in Christ. Number eight. The cost. The cost of salvation. You can't talk about the vocabulary of salvation without talking about the cost, the cross. Look at verse 25. You want to see a whole lot in a very little? Look at them three little words. By his blood. What's come by his blood? The propitiation. Whose blood? God's blood. That personal pronoun should always be capitalized. He is. By his what? By his payment. By what he did at Calvary. And it's only by what, at Calvary, what he did at Calvary that becomes the covering for us that brings us into redemption and brings us into justification. Number nine. I'm going to try to go quick. I, we got baptism to do after church tonight, by the way. So... So hang around if you can. We are going to baptize. Are my baptizing folks going to be here? Are they all here? There you go. There you go. Did I say number nine? Confirmation. Confirmation, that's a long word. That will be your longest vocabulary word of the night. You don't have to spell it. This ain't a spelling test. It's a vocabulary list. Two times in verse 25 and 26, he says the words to demonstrate, to prove. To confirm something. He demonstrates his righteousness. And verse 26 says he demonstrates that righteousness at this present time. He proves his righteous nature by saving us. Again, we'll talk about this in more detail next week. Again, it's late. Number 10 is the word charity. His charity. God's been patient and kind with mankind. Verse 25 says it was because in his forbearance, God put up with us. When you forbear with somebody, you put up with them. Have you ever read in the scriptures where it says we're supposed to forbear with one another in the church? And you know what that means. It means we put up with each other. There'll always be something about somebody that rubs you the wrong way. You can still love them in Jesus and it not be a big problem. If you can only go to church with people that look at everything the same cotton-picking way you do and are exactly the same as you, you will be in a church that runs 12 people, and half them will be kids. And I got news for you, you're probably about three years away from a church split because there'll come a time where you've got to forbear with one another. So many things get blowed up in the world and blowed up in families and blowed up in church because we just can't forbear. If we could be half as patient with people, or if we could be a, a tenth as patient with people as God is with us, we would have so fewer problems. Not everything's got to be addressed. Just because something gets on your nerves about somebody, if it's not done in malice, does, you've got to be talking about it all the time. You, know, you might not like the way your husband picks his teeth, but is it that big a deal? You know, you know, you, some guys always got the same thing to say at church, but, I mean, does it really got to be that big a deal? And especially if it's childish. You know, if it's just somebody being a little simple-minded, I mean, can't a brother get some slack? 
and you just love them anyway. And now the reason I'm going to stop here and talk about it a little bit is in all of this little church, and y'all know there ain't nobody loves y'all like Brother Todd. I mean, it's Jesus and then me. I mean, I, that's how I love you. Right? I mean, Jesus loves you more than me. I'm not going to lie. But, I mean, I love you like your mama loves you. Can I talk to you for a second? If, if you, you will know when you're becoming a grown-up Christian, when somebody can say somebody's name that you probably need to forbear with, and you don't roll your eyes. Some of y'all, when, I, when we talk about somebody, like somebody will do something good, and, you know, like here, this brother here wandering into church late and straggling around, Gary Van. Let's, let's say that. <laughs> he knew it as soon as I started talking. But let's say that I'm talking about, you know, let's say, like, let's say Gary gets over, you know, walking around in church, and he, and he improves. And I say, y'all know, Gary got to where he can just sit in church the whole long Sunday. He's doing so good. And y'all go. And one of y'all goes, yeah, right. Some of y'all do that when I mention people. Because, you know, I just be in a group and I go, boy, I tell you what, man. Oh, Roy, he's doing so good. And some of his kin folk will go, no. <laughs> I'll see. I'll see. But, you know, we'll mention somebody and somebody will go, and you look like you tasted something bad. God, these are people that you love, and you love in Jesus. I mean, what do you think about lost people? When I mention a saved person's name, you go. Well, we'll see. I say, boy, so-and-so's doing better. Well, we'll see. Well, it's like you sit there waiting on them to fail and hoping that they do. Just forbear with them. Well, yes, they get on your nerves. You know, I get on your nerves. That's my own aunt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you at least don't have to do it with your hand in there. But there'll be things like that. But you love me and you give me grace in it. You say, well, Brett Todd means he's doing as good as he can for, you know, as limited as he is. I hope you don't go. <laughs> Somebody say, my pastor, I go to victory down there, Brother Todd. How would you like it if in heaven somebody said, boy, ain't no Todd doing good, and Jesus goes, we'll see. No, because when you know God loves you, and he forbe he's forbeared with all of us before we got saved, because he didn't turn any of us into a big old pile of ass. None of us got to eat up with worms. One brother in the Bible did. Oh, Herod, got God had it with him. He's got to eat up with worms. Right there in front of everybody. But God didn't take that approach with us. We have received kindness. We ought to extend kindness. Christian charity. Hoping for the best. Desiring that people do better. And if it is wrong, it ain't got to be talked about. And it sure ain't got to be talked about out at the restaurant. And it ain't got to be talked about in the bleachers at the gym. If somebody's overtaken in a fault and, and they won't reach their hand up for any kind of help, you don't have to, listen, they're already under the bus. They, you, don't, you don't have to throw them under there. And don't be so small that you feel better about yourself when somebody else fails. Are you that small? Come on, you're a saved person. You're not that small. You know it's, it's fake anyway. It don't really make you feel better about yourself. And then later you feel guilty. Be slow to judge. Slow to speak. Slow to wrath. Listen, if somebody needs judging, pity the person that God puts his hand on. Pity them. You ever saw what God really does to people when he lays into them? You ever saw what God does to people when he really turns them over to Satan? They're to be pitied. I was a young preacher and people really get on my nerves. I'd ask the Lord to fix them. I say, Lord, I don't know what you got to do with them, but you got to get they're in my way. I mean, they're, they're, they're hurting the gospel, and they're sowing discord in the church, and they're, they're mean to me. 
you know, throw myself in there a little bit too, you know, they mean. And I saw God get a hold of a few of them. Now when they start that, I say, oh, Lord, help them. Lord, watch them. You know what, Lord, you're big enough. They ain't no division they can really cause in this church. You can hold all of us together, and they can be hitting on the hammer of division, and, Lord, you can stop them. I ask for grace for them. I ask for peace for them. I ask for help for them. Because I've seen God kill them. I've seen God make them crazy, and I've seen God cripple them so bad that they ain't got time to think about everybody else in the church. You ain't never seen nothing until you've seen God make a man crazy. It's easier for them to die. The ones that God kills straight up, they got it better than the ones God makes crazy. Pity them. God has pitied us. Last verse of, last word on your vocabulary list is the best word. You can't talk about salvation without talking about Christ. Verse 22, it's in Jesus Christ. Verse 26, we have faith in Jesus. In Jesus, Jesus. Over and over and over again, Jesus is the answer. Now, let's do this. If you got it filled in, say, I got it. Fold it up. Put in your Bible. If you didn't bring your Bible with you, we're not going to stink face you tonight. We're not going to. We're not going to do that to you. You bring your Bible next week, you have that list in it. Next week, we're going to call up this list. All right? If you got it, say, I got it. Would you bow your head with me? As serious as we can be. I want to thank you again for being a part of the service today. I hope that something in the message spoke to you. Not the kind of speaking to you of just a man making a speech to an audience, but the kind of speaking that God does as he uses his word to speak into our lives. You know, the Bible says that the, the word of God will never return to God empty. And I pray that the message we've, that you've listened to today and been a part of today is going to be something that God is going to use to pour good things into your life. If you're already a believer in Jesus Christ, I pray the message today inspired you, challenged you, convicted you to go out and do wonderful and great things as you follow the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that you trust him in the circumstances and situations of life and see that if he doesn't work out a great plan in a good way. If you've never really made Christ your Savior, if you're, there's never been a time where you've really become a believer in Jesus Christ, not about him, but really trusting in Him. I want to ask you, today during the message, or maybe even right now, was there a time, and is there a time, where you, you sense and know that God is calling you, that He's speaking to you, that He's drawing you, as it were? Jesus said that unless the Father draws a person, they can't come to Him. God gives us this call to give us an opportunity. You know, the truth is, God doesn't have to call us to judge us. He calls us so that good things can happen in our life. When that call happens, usually two things are going to happen in somebody's life. There's going to be a convicting. There's going to be a stirring. Uh, the reality that we're sinners starts really moving in us, and we recognize a holy God is talking to us, and sometimes we feel ashamed. Sometimes we just feel like we don't measure up. But the, but the, the good thing about that is that God is letting us know there's a problem, and he's letting us know that his son is the solution. Jesus Christ himself said, I came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. And so if God is drawing you, he's drawing you from the problem to a solution. And I pray today that, that as you sense that calling and maybe you're, as you're dealing with that conviction, that you won't stop there, that you won't just end this, this time with us together today just being convicted, but that you would rather hear that second part that, that God is speaking to, to you about, and that is that his son is the answer. His son dying for you on the cross is what pays for your sins. His son rising from the grave is what justifies us and gives us life. That's what the Bible tells us, that Christ was accomplishing for us. You know, the fact, in fact, the Bible says that he who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus, became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ died on the cross to be our substitute, to take our place and to pay our price. And I hope as God is calling you today that you're being aware of that. And if you recognize that sin's a problem, and if you recognize that Christ is the solution, I hope that you'll take the next step, and that is to believe enough to act. The Bible tells us that the, the way to do that is to pray. 
The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says, whoever will confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, they will be saved. And so I pray today that, that you're willing to take that next really big step of becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, really trusting in Him. In just a few moments, if God is calling you to be saved, I'm going to lead a prayer uh, that I would encourage you to pray. Now, I want to be the first person to tell you, uh, and I think you probably realize this, that you, don't, you wouldn't be saved, you wouldn't be made holy in God by just repeating after some preacher on the Internet. There's got to be some faith there. There's got to be some real belief there. And I'm offering this prayer to you today as a guide. If you mean what you say to God based on the authority of the Word of God, I know that God will save your soul. He'll save your spirit. He'll, he'll, the Bible tells us that He justifies our spirit. He sanctifies our mind. And He one day will glorify our flesh. God will do great things in us beyond what even we can, the Bible says, even hope or imagine. So if you know God's calling you to be saved and you want to become a follower of Jesus Christ, I would encourage you now, right where you're at or whatever device or computer you're, you're watching on, to just bow your head and close your eyes and take a moment and think about God. And as you think about Him, just say to Him uh, with, with all your understanding and, and with all your trust, just say something like this to Him. Just say, Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I know I cannot save myself. But with all of my heart, I believe that you died for me, and I believe you rose from the grave to give me life. I want to understand it more, and I want to grow in it. I ask you today to forgive me of my sins. I want to turn from them, and I want to turn to you. I ask you to cover them and remove them from my life. I want to follow you. I want you to be my Lord, and I want you to be my Savior because I need you. And I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so if you just lift up your eyes and kind of look at the screen again or just begin to listen a little bit, I want to talk to you about that prayer you just prayed. If you meant what you said to God as God was calling you, then based on the authority of the Word of God, which says things like this, that for as many people as have received Him, to them He has given the power to be the children of God and to everyone who believes on His name. Again, like I've already said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Based on the authority of the Word of God, I want to congratulate you for becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, what you did today is the first step, and it's the big step, but there's a lot of things you need to do in your life to really begin to grow. Uh, I know that as this broadcast goes out over the Internet, it, it lands in a lot of different places. Some of you may be around churches. You may be where churches, genuine churches that preach Christ and, and, and are authentic. Maybe you, you know of one of those. Maybe you can attend one of those. And you need to go to that church and let them know what you've done today. Uh, but regardless, uh, maybe you're in a land where there, there are no churches right now, or you sure can't find any believers. You may be the first in your area, and, and that's okay too. God knew you were going to be that person before uh, any of us were ever born. I just want to, I want to encourage you to follow up and, and to let somebody know. You know, Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father and the angels in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father and the angels of heaven. It, you, it's important to let, it, to let it be known what God has done in your life. Somewhere on the website that where you, you found this broadcast or somewhere on a banner or somewhere around uh, on the screen, uh, there will be the phone number, the address, the email address of our church. I want you to, I want to really encourage you to let us know what you've done today. We want to try to help you, whether it's help you find a church or encourage you in your new walk to let you know what you need to do. You need the help of other brothers and sisters in Christ. And the reality is that's what you are now. You're part of the kingdom of God and you've been made new in Him and you're part of what He's doing. And we want to help you just like somebody helped me in my life. Uh, I want to be a part of, of helping you and yours. So it's really important to, uh, to contact us. You can contact us through email. Uh, if you're where you can make a phone call, uh, whatever, somebody will be returning it. Somebody will be talking to you. Uh, but the main thing is just to, is to follow up and, and to be encouraged and to realize that God called you to do great things in you. Don't ever forget that. God called you to make you part, part of His family, to be a part of His kingdom, and He does great things in His people, and He has great plans for His kingdom. So I'm so glad that you've prayed and asked Christ to be your Savior. 
Be sure and follow up. Really begin to grow in Christ. If you can find a Bible, you get it, you start reading it, and God will bless you and He'll speak more to you just like He's spoken to you today. Now, we'll be, uh, Lord willing, we'll be back on this channel, so to speak, uh, about the same time every week. And we encourage you, if you can, to be a part of the broadcast every week. Uh, God bless you, and I pray that, that you'll be trusting Him uh, to do great things in your life.